Recovering from knee surgery is highly variable. It was going to take forever to get better if I was ever going to get better. There's got to be something out there besides a CPM machine, which and clearly isn't helping me. Active and aggressive with this thing, or I was going to. You know, I'm a guy that's not looking to relieve the pain. I'm a guy that's looking to get back in the game. That downtime was not what I wanted. We've spent the last seven years perfecting the recovery system that takes variability out of knee rehab so you can quickly get back to your life. Welcome to The Bee's Knees, a podcast full of articles, interviews, clinical studies, and advice about knee surgery, physical therapy, and life after knee surgery. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I'm Dr. John Williams. I'm a board-certified, fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in adult reconstruction of the hip and knee, which means that I did an extra year of training after orthopedic residency to learn how to do hip and knee replacements and revisions thereof. So I'm fellowship trained. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I went to medical school at, at Howard University uh, College of Medicine. I graduated 30 years after my father graduated from Howard University's College of Medicine. He's a retired orthopedic surgeon. I did my internship at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C., and I did my residency at Howard University. And I did my fellowship at a place called Joint Implant Surgeons in Columbus, Ohio. After that, I went back to Philadelphia and spent 11 years as an attending at Albert Einstein Medical Center, where the last seven of which I was the director of the Total Joint Program. And I was getting a little stale in academic medicine and wanted to, to move on to different, to dip, not greener, say just different horizons, because I love Einstein. And I knew some surgeons down here, so I ended up coming down to the, the villages. You know, I do hip knee replacements, so obviously when I visit the villages and I saw the population of patients <laughs> who are older, who want to stay active, I planted my flag immediately, okay? <laughs> All right. So I'm now the president of Advanced Orthopedics Institute. There's two of us, Dr. Alfred Cook and myself. And Dr. Cook is a fellowship trained sports medicine orthopedic surgeon which means he does all types of upper extremity work, hands, elbows, shoulders, does a lot of shoulder replacements, a lot of arthroscopic procedures of the hip and knee, uh, and some ankle procedures. So we have everything covered at our institution except uh, spine surgery and elective foot and ankle. Other than that, we can take care of you. All right, like I said, so I am second generation. My father is a retired orthopedic surgeon, worked at Albert Einstein Medical Center for f between his residency and everything else for 50 years. He's 86 and doing well, and he just came down from Philadelphia to spend Thanksgiving with me. My mother came with him. All right. All right, as I said, I was the former director of the Total Joint Program at Albert Einstein Medical Center. Now, having spent 11 years at Einstein, there's a lot of Einstein-isms that we had, and one is, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I put that slide there because I pride myself on being able to communicate to my patients what it is that's wrong with them. I try to teach. I taught residents for 11 years, and I make sure that patients have as clear as possible a picture of what their problem is, what the treatment recommendations are, from non-operative through operative. And I, make sure, I feel that a patient that is educated about their problem, it may alleviate some of their anxiety, and I, it helps them help themselves. All right, so now, I came down here. Now, larger population. There's a new patient. During my father's heyday, patients would go to my dad's office and have a bad hip or knee, and he would say, you need surgery, and they would, they would say, yes, doctor. And that's all it was. They didn't ask very many questions. There wasn't any internet. My father didn't have people coming in with pages from the internet describing various implants and surgical approaches, okay? So, but we're, there's a large number of patients because there's more of us living longer. Um, with longer life expectancy and more active, especially down here in the villages. I always told my initial greeting to the villages as far as being a practitioner. I was in practice about a month and I saw a 79-year-old gentleman and he thought it was his hip, he had a bad back. And uh, I got an MRI of his back and he had horrible spinal stenosis and he was just frustrated because he wanted me to find a way for him to get down for those grounders. <laughs> and, I, and I said, sir. <laughs> I said, I can't get down on myself anymore. <laughs> but, but obviously, everybody wants to stay active here. Pickleball, golf, some tennis, you know, a little bit of everything. Patients are better informed, not always 
with accurate information, but better informed. Patients come asking about, like I said, what, what kind of implant you're going to use, what's your surgical approach. They, they come with something saying, I want to have a makoplasty, or I want this, the Smith and Nephew knee. And uh, so I try to tell them the pros and cons of the various systems and surgical approaches. One thing I always tell patients is that it's not the surgical approach per se, it's the surgeon. Because if you go try and find a surgical approach, I know a lot of people, I know people who do various types of approaches, and some of them might do an approach that patients think is, is a new fangled approach that's great, but I know the person is not that good at it, okay? And somebody might be a little more old school and do a more traditional approach, and his patients do fantastic. So I always tell patients, make sure you check out the surgeon and not the surgical approach, okay? And there's higher expectations. When I was training in the 90s, we'd tell patients, it takes six months to a year to get over a joint replacement. Now patients expect to be dancing a jig in about three or four weeks. <laughs> so some people can do that, others can't. I also inform patients that we are not like a Ford Taurus off the assembly line where all the specs are the same. Everybody's body is different. If I do 10 new replacements, they all seem to be the same. People's physiologic response will, change, will, will, alter, will differ. Somebody will have very little swelling, somebody will have a lot of swelling. So, so don't be discouraged if you have a surgery and your friend was dancing in four weeks and you're not. You, everybody's not the same, but most people should get to the same good endpoint eventually. All right, now I just like, like, like the slide looks cool, that's why I put this in there. So baby boomers, baby boomers, 1946 to 1964, I am a baby boomer. <laughs> Yes, I am. January 2nd, 1964. <laughs> I thought this was a pretty cool slide because, you know, you see there with the person with the uh, rolling walker with the skateboard. Uh, obviously, he wants to stay active. All right. So with increased activity and increased longevity, what happens? The parts start to wear. So what I'm going to do first here, and you might have heard this ad nauseum from other talks, but I like to make sure that everybody understands what arthritis is, what wearing your joints is, the physi a lot, phys physiology behind it, or the pathophysiology behind it, to be more accurate. Wait, what is arthritis? Somebody will say, Dr. Williams, I had arthritis in my left knee, and it moved to my right hip, and then moved to my left shoulder. No, arthritis does not move around, okay, like that. You have an equal opportunity for all your joints to wear out, but they wear out separately. When we are growing, we have cells called chondrocytes that make cartilage. So cartilage is an extracellular matrix, means they extrude outside of the, the cell body. So through your, your, you know, your formative years until, until adolescence and mid-teenage years, you're making cartilage. That cartilage cells are making cartilage and laying it down. By the time you are finished growing in your mid to late teens, that's about as much cartilage as you're going to have. From that point on in your life, it's wearing out. Now, there, are, there is some activity of chondrocytes or cartilage cells, but not much. So like a brake pad on a car or tread on a tire, when you're, eight, when, when you're 18, you are wearing it down. Cartilage has no nerve endings. That's why if you have good cartilage layer, it doesn't hurt. It also has no blood supply. And any tissue that has no blood supply cannot repair or heal itself. So there are two types of main arthritis. In, inflammatory arthropathies, rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually a disease process. It is your body attacking its own tissue, IgG, anti-IgM. What it is is that your body will no longer recognize its normal tissue as self and attacks itself. And that's what rheumatoid arthritis is. There are lots of inflammatory arthropathies. There's psoriatic arthritis. There's seronegative arthropathies. But these are disease processes. Most people don't have that. Most people have good old fashion. I've been walking since I've been a year old and is wearing out. Garden variety arthritis. All right, so what happens? Cartilage covers all the ends of our bones. All the two bones that come together and move in that position, there is cartilage there. When it's a good layer, like I said, you feel good. It starts to wear out, it starts to have fissuring and pits. The underlying bone gets exposed. That's the part I didn't say yet. Bone has nerve endings. That's why it hurts to break a bone. Bone has a blood supply. That's why you can heal a fracture. But when the cartilage wears away to the point that these underlying bone starts to be exposed, that's when it starts to hurt you. 
And then next thing happens that inflammatory mediators are released and you get swollen tissue, swollen, you know, and that's why it's warm because inflammation occurs and inflammation involves increased blood flow, blood carries warmth. So an inflamed joint is going to be warm, it's going to be tender, and one of the things we do to try and counteract that is give anti-inflammatory drugs. They don't repair your cartilage, but they decrease some of the inflammation, which decreases the irritation of the, the pain uh, fibers. All right, so quickly, we have deformity in the knee. You can't see it in the hip. As one part starts to wear, usually people will have asymmetric wear. Nine out of 10 of us will wear out the inside part of the knee, which is in here. As that joint space collapses, they become bow-legged. One out of 10 people will wear out the outside part of the knee called a valgus deformity, and they'll become knock-kneed. Less frequently, somebody will have one valgus knee, one varus knee, and it appears as though the wind swept their feet up from, from under them. It's called a wind swept deformity. Don't see that too often, but we see it from time to time. Just various things that, that we uh, see in practice. I'll run through some of these uh, diagrams here. Here you see on the left, normal, the cartilage looks good. On the right, starting having pits and fissures, and that's painful. Radiographic appearance. Cartilage is radiolucent or invisible on x-ray. So when you have a good cartilage layer, you'll see space between the bones. It's not always a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's pretty close. So the knee here on, the, on your right is a pretty normal looking knee. Nice joint space, the margins are smooth. As the cartilage wears away, the two bones on either side of the joint appear to approximate each other more and more. So as that, as that interval gets thinner and thinner, you, we can determine indirectly that the cartilage is wearing away. The body is amazing and tries to heal itself. So when the cartilage wears away, an underlying bone gets exposed, the, the bone cells called osteocytes, the body tries to protect itself. So the osteocytes say, okay, I'm feeling more stress and pressure and friction, and their response is to make more bone. The problem is it does not make bone in a useful fashion. It makes bone in spikes and spurs. We call osteophytes, and that's why you get bone spurs. So a bone spur is a result of somewhere in that joint where the cartilage is worn down to the point that the bone is reacting to it. Another thing, that, so that's joint space narrowing, one sign of, one radiographic sign of, of uh, increasing arthritis. Osteophyte or bone spur formation, other sign. The third thing is this, in trying to heal itself, protect itself rather, this, the body will increase the calcium deposition or mineralization in that area. The more calcium you have, the more densely white or ivory the bone appear, appears. So we call that subchondral below cartilage sclerosis. So the three main signs of advancing arthritis are joint space narrowing, osteophyte bone spur formation, and subchondral sclerosis. Look how densely white this is as compared to this knee. That is about as dramatic a comparison as we can find. Same thing happens with the hip. I won't, you know, belabor that too much, you can see. But the hip is a ball and socket joint. Here on your left, you have good joint space here. The, the thermal head is nice and smooth, good sphericity. You can see that, and you have space there, that if you actually, actually took the, the proximal femur here, top of the femur, and you were to try to rotate that back and forth like a pendulum, the ball would spin smoothly in the socket. On the right side, what things did I say? Joint space narrowing. Anybody see any joint space there? You see some bone spurs there, a couple bone spurs. It's a little harder to see an untrained eye, but it's pointing right there. And look how, how, how ivory that appears. I forgot to mention early on that in the smaller groups, if you have a question, you can interrupt me and ask at the time the question pops into your head. So you can ask me any question anytime. All questions are, are, are fair. All right, so what are the symptoms of arthritis? Well, I'm a big Bob Marley fan, and Bob Marley sings in a song, Who Feels It Knows It, okay? So if you've had some aches and pains from arthritis, you know what it feels like. Warm to touch, we said from inflammation, increased blood flow. Joint swelling, the cells that make fluid called your synovial cells, one of their responses or reactions to increase inflammation is to make more fluid. You can't really see it in the hip, 
and sh the shoulder you can't really see, but the knee is one joint that you can see it big time. So somebody might have a swollen knee, that's called an arthritic effusion. It's one of the, and so we might drain your knee from time to time. Stiffness, well obviously if it hurts, you might not want to move it as much. And also you have the range of motion becomes more difficult if the joint doesn't move smoothly. All those things, yeah, you might not be as active after that, huh? You're swollen, it's hurting, you're, you're decreasing your activity level. Impairs your lifestyle, joint deformities, and pain. So at some point, patients will, well, people will come and seek help, seek intervention. So we want a proper diagnosis, medical history, symptoms, health, all those things, make sure we get the whole, whole deal. You know, if, if you tell me that everybody in your family had rheumatoid arthritis, I might want to work you up for that. You tell me that you were, you know, a big time athlete doing this, you know, you probably wore it out, but you could have been a, a, a typist your whole life and still worn out your, your hips. X-ray is obviously very important. Treatments. The first thing and the easiest thing to do is to take a anti-inflammatory medication. Now, I know a lot of primary care doctors will tell patients, no, we don't want you taking that Aleve or Advil, that stuff, it can mess your kidneys up, it can mess up your, your, your intestinal tract, your stomach. This is what we with big surgeons say. It's the easiest thing to do, and chances are it's not going to do those things. So if you can take an Advil or Aleve occasionally and it makes you feel better, do it, okay, rather than live in pain. If you take these medications on a daily basis or a frequent basis, they can irritate your stomach, so you take it with food. If you have kidney disease, because aspirin-based drugs are cleared through your kidneys, and acetaminophen or Tylenol is cleared through your liver, so if you have kidney disease, you have to be careful taking them. If you don't have no kidney disease and you take it frequently, you have maybe a 15% chance that over time it might affect your kidneys. And to make sure you, pay, you know, you don't miss that, just see your primary care doctor two or three times a year and get a basic metabolic panel with which we check your kidney function. I'm not saying to go and eat you know, Motrin every day, all day, every day, but I'm saying that if it helps, I think it's the least of the evils. Just to take that, that works, you're good, okay? Now, other things, rest and ice. If somebody comes and says, Doc, uh, I walk seven miles every day, man, by that six mile is hurting me. I'm like, hey. <laughs> You know, <laughs> five miles. But rest and ice, obviously I've said that it involves inflammation and increased blood flow. Ice is great for joints because it decreases the blood flow, which decreases the inflammatory mediators and may decrease the swelling and pain. Diet, both diet from a calorie standpoint, and there are some foods you can, you can eat, but I don't get into that, but diet things can be helpful. That's one thing you can look on the internet for, which is safe, okay? Exercise, exercise ties into physical therapy because the stronger the muscles are that span a joint, the more efficient that joint movement and that decreases the amount of force generated across the joint interface. So for your knee, if your quadriceps muscles, your hamstring, mu hamstring muscles, your gastroc soleus complex, if they are stronger, then your, your knee will move more efficiently and therefore it may not generate as much force and hurt as bad. That's why physical therapy can be helpful. Walking aids, cane, that's not bad to use a cane. I mean, if you use a cane and you do okay, fine. If you're on a walker, you probably need some help, okay? Bracing works for knees. We have unloaded braces, things that help to, I showed you, showed you the deformities. There are braces that help to correct the deformity. So if somebody has a bow leg various deformity, we have braces that will try and straighten them out a little bit and take the pressure off the part that has collapsed the most, and that may decrease your pain. Supplements. There are chondroprotective agents, the things we call glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, prop, prop, uh, products, things such as that, they can be very helpful. They've been shown to help improve the milieu of the joint, which means that you decrease the inflammation a little bit, help your body make a better synovial fluid that bathes the joint as we age. When we're younger, the synovial fluid is much more like olive oil and viscous, much more lubricating. As we get older, it becomes more watery, okay? So these things have been, been shown to help that. When I started my uh, residency at, at Howard, my father-in-law, he had a he had bad back, God rest his soul, he passed away recently. He had a bad back, and he was eating Motrin and Naperson, and he had me bringing stuff back from the office from where we, at Howard University. And then he started taking Osteobiflex. About three months later, he stopped taking Naperson anti-inflammatory agents. It didn't take it for like 10 years. It helped them. So these things can be helpful. They don't always help. 
They take a while to act, but you have to be careful. They're FDA approved, not FDA regulated, so you have to make sure you get a reputable brand. Give yourself, you know, it's probably about $40 a month, you know, but they can't be helpful. Medications, we mentioned the, you know, there, there are prescription uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, Celebrex, Meloxicam, Diclofenac, things such as that, and injectables. There's always a good old-fashioned cortisone shot. We even do it for the hip. The inflammation and pain are there, so we give you an anti-inflammatory. But this is a direct injection of anti-inflammatory medication right into the spot. That's cortisone. There are gel injections, mostly for the knee, because they're not approved for anything but the knee in this country. In other countries, you can use it in the neck, wrist, elbow, wherever, but here, only the knee, okay? That's the, the chicken fat you might have heard about, or you know, the booster combs. It is a thick gel concentrate of all the good components of knee fluid. So the theory is we inject it into your knee. There are some one-shot uh, 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 injections that are out there, although insurance companies have been iffy about paying for a lot of those this time. The one-shot ones are more expensive. The other, other, other types are, there's a series of three shots, which I use, a series of five shots. You come once a week for three weeks, once a week for five weeks, give you the injections. They're slow acting, but they, we do have good results. I'd say about 60 to 70% of the patients think it works for them. It may last five, six months. Your insurance company will pay for it. You to have it every six months if it's effective, okay? And then the last thing is regenerative medicine. And many of you might have, you've probably heard of stem cell. You might have gone to a stem cell presentation. I know that everybody's coming up to the villages and trying to give their stem cell spiel. Stem cells are very good. We use them in all aspects of medicine. In musculoskeletal medicine, orthopedics, it's not, uh, it's not paid for by the insurance companies. So it's out of your pocket. And this is where it's like the Wild West. You can charge $3,000 for it. You can charge $20,000 for it. You can charge whatever patient's gonna pay you. We have nothing wrong with chiropractic, but it's chiropractor in the area offering stem cell for $7,500, okay? I say, this is the thing with stem cell. The worst of the arthritis, the inferior, the results of stem cell, what stem cell treatment is this. It is, we take undifferentiated cells, which means cells that have not turned into anything specific yet. You take a stem cell and put it into your liver, it becomes a hepatocyte liver cell. You take a stem cell and put it in your kidney, it becomes a nephrocyte kidney cell. You put it into your knee, it'll turn into some Snowville tissue, maybe a little bit of cartilage if you're lucky. What it does is it improves, once again, the milieu of the joint. But like planting seeds, grass seeds in, you know, to your lawn, you have to fertilize it and wait for it to grow, so it takes a while. I've done, maybe now, we did a couple more recently, a little bit less than 20 stem cells over the last 18 months. I'm very selective because if you have se severe arthritis, I don't want you to waste your money unless you have some Bugatti keys on the desk and I might <laughs> sell you something like that. But, <laughs> but other than that, I don't want you selling your car to get stem cell. And uh, I've had about 80% good results. It can, be, it can be helpful. It just takes a little while. But, and then there's something else that I've used a couple of times recently called is an amniofix, which is a stem cell recruiter, which helps to recruit stem cells. Dr. Cook and I both, that's, that, that one's $1,000. The stem cell is $3,000. I'm not telling, telling you that to sell you it for you to come to the office. I'm just saying that we have it available. Just wherever you go, make sure that the person research the brand they're gonna give you because it's all over the place with how many stem cells are in there. And also be a little bit careful of somebody wanting to do a procedure where they go into your body and take your own stem cells, give it back to you. It sounds great if you're 30 years old and you're getting a 30 year old stem cell. <laughs> if you're 70, you're getting some 70 year old stem cells, okay? And they're not able to really do a quality control to, let, to know how many they've aspirated from some part of your body and how, much, how many they're injecting. If you're going to spend your money, get live stem cell, that is donor stem cell from somebody, either amniotic tissue, placental tissue, um, or umbilical tissue. All right. So back to the top of that, is heat ever appropriate? Heat is good for a muscle belly. Your lower back hurts, put heat on it. Your quad hurts, heat on it. Your knee hurts, put ice on it. So heat for muscle belly, ice for a joint. I mean, I mean, heat may make, it, may make your knee feel a little better for a little while, but it's going to bring blood flow, which can bring, increase the inflammation, so that's why, that's why it's not good. All right, so when should we consider joint replacement? I can say a whole lot of things. We know when conservative treatments fail, you try some stuff, you know, your activity is limited, all that stuff. You know what it is? You, you get, when you've tried enough that you think it was reasonable to, to try and take care of it, and then you wake up one day and say, I've had it. It's killing me. I don't want to live this anymore, okay? 
that's when you have your joint replaced. The next person I talk into with hip or knee replacement will be the first person. I've been doing 18 years. I'll say you're a good candidate for it. You probably benefit from it, but I'm not going to talk you into it. So when you're ready, you get it done. Now, if somebody comes and says they want their hip replaced and looks normal, I'm not doing it. But obviously, if you are a good candidate, and when you're ready, we do it. And we try to, there are different types of knee replacements and hip replacements, and we try to select the implant we feel is best for the patient. That's when you have to leave it up to the surgeon's discretion. And I hope that my colleagues do the right thing by the patients. I believe most of them do. And you might have, I'm 54, many people are probably older than me. When joint placement first started, we say they lasted about 10, 12 years. And the, the part that was the rate limiting step was the liner, the polyethylene liner. Because the, prior to 1999, most companies' liners lasted about 10, 12 years. That's just on average. Some people got lucky, last 20 years, some people eight years. In 1999, Zimmer was the first company to come up with a new way of processing liners. Now everybody does it, so the liners last a lot longer than that. That coupled with the fact that our ability to do redo surgery, because my father started, if you got a knee replacement and it wore out in about 12 years, they didn't really have good redo stuff. They might have been scratching their head like, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna fix this now. And that's why they were hesitant to do joint replacement in patients who were younger, say under 60. Now, the longevity of the implants, a well done hip or knee replacement, that the patient heals nicely, x-rays look good, there's an 80% chance it's gonna last 20 years or more. And at some point, if something fails, we, we are so good at redos that we no longer really use age in general's criteria. If somebody comes to me at 42 and has a bad knee, what, make them wait 10 years and lose 10 years of their life, having a good life? We do it, okay? All joint placements basically are changing the, inter the surface interface of your joint, whether it's a ball and socket for the hip or a hinge for your knee. All of them, no matter what company it is, are using titanium alloy, cobalt chrome, and usually polyethylene as a liner. Now, you might have heard something about metal on metal. I'll just say this. There was a period of time that we thought that using a metal, say, femoral head with a metal liner and acetabular component, which I'll show you what this looks like, is a good idea. We found that it's not that good idea because it created too many metal ions. I never used metal on metal. I just didn't, I just felt a little anxious about it. And many have been recalled. That's really, there's only been a couple real recalls from the FDA. When you watch TV and some, you see something that says, have you had a joint replacement? Does your knee hurt? <laughs> Call 1-800-BAD-DOC, okay? Those are not recalls. We feel that any implant that is going to be available for use by surgeons, if, if the surgery is performed correctly in, in the right patient, it should have a 90 95% chance of being effective. If it's a 75% chance of being effective, we don't want to use that anymore, so we'll just stop using it. It's not a recall. It still works three quarters of the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little sensitive about that because prior to 1970, every human being ever walked the face of the earth and had a bad hip or knee, guess what they did? They died with it. Now we can, we, now we can do heart transplant, kidney transplant, liver transplant, hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement, all this stuff. But according to Morgan and Morgan, we're not very good people, okay? <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm off my soapbox. All right, and I tried my best to do, I like to say, lesser invasive surgery rather than minimally invasive surgery. When I trained in the 90s, my mentor used to say, Williams, incisions heal side to side, not end to end. And he would take the scalpel, except for a hip, and, and you could be outside the room and see what he was doing in the wound there. We've been able to keep the, make the incisions smaller and smaller and smaller. I tell patients I make the, my incisions as small as I can possibly make it, but large enough to put the implant in correctly, okay? And with that, with decreasing the amount of dissection, and I'll say this to Rebecca, every hip replacement affects muscle. When colleagues say, we do, we don't touch your muscle. You know, muscles never, never we can't get out of this room without going through that door, right? You cannot get into a hip joint and do surgery without doing a little something to the muscle. 
So what we try to do is we try to minimize that, and that's where we have the various surgical approaches. And it's more than just, say, a direct anterior, there's many incision anterior lateral, there's many incision posterior approaches. That goes back to where the surgeon just needs to be good at whatever it is he does, okay? Uh, but it does, it can offer a little faster recovery. Low morbidity means that, you know, the patient may heal a little faster, have a little less pain. Reduce costs if they heal faster. These are all things that we can have increased the opportunity that, for it to occur. It doesn't guarantee everybody's gonna do that. There's some people, no matter what you do, they still heal at the old fashioned rate. That's just their bodies. All right. Uh, we don't do it for cosmesis. And short term results. Oh, this is a good slide to lead into. Is my next slide coming up? Is it? Oh, I'll get to the knee. Remind me to talk about the lateral approach to the knee, which you might have heard about, okay? Hip replacements, we do a little under 400,000 a year in this country, very pop operation. We do about twice as many knees as hips a year in this country because people, twice as many people get knee arthritis that requires surgery. So I have to, I'm gonna have a little clicker here. It's a very popular operation. I think I've done over 2,500 hip replacements in my career and probably close to, I don't know, you know, third of the, 25% of those revisions. You know, I've, I've done a number of them. And let's get to some here. So here we go. Now, there's different types of systems. You can do a cemented hip replacement, put a little cement in there, usually for somebody's osteoporotic, product, a little older, cementless. Every company has its own type of femoral component, and most companies have many types of femoral components. You can get one that squeezes at the top, one that squeezes down further below. But all essentially end up just being different ways of fixation for the ball and socket to come together. We have more choices than we did before as far as neck lengths and things such as that. But all hip replacements in general for each company usually has two we call offsets, which means that the distance between the center of that ball and the side of your trochanter or decided to say the, the, the implant itself, you have regular and you have extended. You've got two choices, okay? You have, you, have, you have more choices as far as the thickness of the stem, in the, but as far as neck length, that's it. As far as the version, for our femur, all of our, if we go from the knee up to the hip region, and then the femoral neck and head actually projects forward about 15 to 20 degrees. All companies' implants, whatever they've chosen, 17 degrees or whatever, it's the same one on every single implant. And they've worked fine over the years, but obviously the more you can have an implant tailored to an individual's anatomy, their anatomy, the better chance that it may feel more normal to them and create their own biomechanics. Now Conformis has done this for the knee, they've been around for, a, for, for, for quite a long time, and it works very well. And don't get me wrong, the off-the-shelf ones work well too, I've done those for years, but I do believe that the the next horizon is most companies developing a customized type of hip. Now, Conformis just developed a new custom hip system, which I just started using it, so I, I can't tell you I have a long track record with it. The implant itself is not, is not, is, 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 a, is an implant that's been around for a while, the style of the implant. So the fixation to the bone is the same. What they've customized is they've customized the part that projects how to get to out of the bone, the neck part, here, because everybody has a different distance here. So the fixation is still a tried and true fixation, but they will custom make the length of the neck, the version of the neck, how far it, it points forward. Some people are retroverted, and where the acetabular component sits. So these are the things that they have done for us through 3D printing, and using, after from a CT scan, to try to make it customized. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool device. The knee has proven to be a tremendous of, a device. All right. So, they, like I said, we get a CT scan of the knee, I mean, of the, of the hip here. What they do is they use the long axis of the femur from your pelvis down through your knee, even will go down to your ankle and make sure they get everything just right. For the acetabular component, what we do is we get a 3D model. So they, when they show us how the acetabular component is going to sit in the pelvis. And what we do is we go over the plan so the, so the computer tells us what it, it thinks is the best plan for the patient and then we as surgeons with our reps, we can look at it and we can say, well, I, I agree with this or I, I think I wanna tweak this, tweak that, and we can fine tune it and then we do the surgery and we have the instruments to put the implants in exactly where we, 
had determined they needed to be. And that's just some same thing. I won't bore you too much with that. But it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool device here, guys. And other thing is that it does not cost you anything extra. The way it works in medicine, say in surgery, is that your insurance company is going to give the hospital one lump sum of money. And out of that, the hospital has to pay all of its expenses. One of the expenses is the implant. So for Central Florida Health, and I'm one of the physicians that's on the board for product purchasing, so we have to, there's a 14 hospital consortium, and we feel that with numbers, we can have a little more power with negotiating with these, with these, uh, with the, with, the, with the merchants, the implant companies and everybody else. Um, and so what we say is that for your product to be available at our institutions, it, say a knee replacement or hip replacement, it needs to come within this price margin. And so as long as the vendor is going to give us that product within that price margin, it's available to the surgeons at the hospital. So Conformis is able to do that with their custom implants. So it costs you nothing extra. Do you have a question? Would you guys have a glance question? Okay. All right. And acetabular component essentially is, imagine taking half of a tennis ball. That's what it is. What we do is, I don't have the slides in here that show the actual surgical procedure, but we actually take spinning devices. Orthopedic surgery is like sterile carpentry. So for the acetabulum, we have these little spinning devices called reamers that we use a small one, smaller than the diameter of the acetabulum, and we put it in and we spin. And we put another one in, a little larger, say two millimeters at a time, larger, 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 to get to the one that just perfectly scrapes the inside of the acetabular wall, removing any residual cartilage and machining it to a particular size. And whatever that size is that we stop at, 54 millimeter, we get the 54 millimeter shell and put that in, which has about a one and a half millimeter press fit. And it should stick. People have different quality bone, everybody's different, so many of us, myself is one of them, we will take and we will put a screw or two through a hole in that cup, in a dome, to anchor it to the pelvis. Most implants for hips are cementless, which means we wait for your bone to grow onto it. We anchor it with a screw because it takes about six to 12 months for your bone to grow on, and so we feel more sure that it will not move so the bone goes on correctly. In 18 years of practice, I have not had to revise an acetabular component if they need to be revised, they didn't come back to me, so I don't know, but I've not done one, so I put a screw into every time. And, and with the conformist custom hip, they tell us pretty much where to seat that component, how deep to put it, how much lateral opening it should have, this is flat, this is too high, how to angle it forward and backwards. And that, the theory behind that is that will help maximize your musculature around it and make sure that the lever arm lengthen the muscle from the point of rotation is maximized for your body. And that's that slide that shows the, the version of the neck there. We had somebody we did today that was retroverted. It was a very difficult case because instead of facing forward, they were facing backwards. It was a little tough, yeah. That's why I tell people, everybody's not the same. You know, but you know, if you do a lot of them, you, you, you see so much stuff, you see a little bit of everything, you can, you can deal with it. Here's, here's a, let me go back. Well, I don't know if I can go back. There's a, a, a statistic that a lot of patients don't know, and it still holds true for the most part in this country. 75% of the total joints done in this country are done, done by physicians who do, do less than 25 a year. Unless you were going to a center where, where a fellowship trained person, you get somebody that doesn't do that many. So here in the villages, we have fellowship trained patients, surgeons rather. You know, in Philadelphia, we had Einstein, Temple, <laughs> Jefferson, University of Pennsylvania. But if you're in some other area, you may just get the doctor that did 10 hips last year, 10 knees, do a little rotator cuff, do your bunion, whatever. And, and so I just say, I know I'm biased, that if somebody specializes in something, does a lot of them, they're more likely to have a higher success rate. So just be careful. That goes back to not the, the surgical approach, it's the surgeon. All right, guys, let's keep rocking and rolling. And this is just uh, with the custom implants. All of these devices here, these, these polymers, those are all custom 
instruments by which we prepare the bone. One time use, they're made just for you, just for your body. It also saves the hospital money because other systems, which I, ones I used for years, might have eight, nine, ten trays of instruments because you don't know what you're going to, you know, you, you have to have every size, every cutting device, every jig. Here they make the little one thing because they made it for use. So we know what size we need, the size they made. All right, some radiographs. Here is a hip replacement, nice tight fit inside the proximal femur, nice tight fit there. With the acetabular component, there's the ball. The ball is, is actually attached to the neck, and you say people have their hips dislocate. The thing that's holding that ball in that socket is the muscle tensioning of the muscles around it, and then what's called a capsule. And a capsule you can't see on an x-ray but a capsule we see in surgery. We have to open your capsule at the time of surgery, then we try to sew it back down. It takes about six to 12 weeks for that capsule to actually heal in and help seal the ball in. And that's why we have hip precautions. There are some surgeons who do certain approaches to say that there's no, you don't need to have your hip precautions. That's foolish, because any hip that's been operated on can dislocate, okay? So it is the angle of, of, of the ball in the socket, angle of the cup, the soft tissue tensioning, and then the capsule that makes that hip stable. All right, recovery. Right now, our hospital stay is probably average probably two days. I'd say about 65 to 70% of my patients go home with home health. Maybe about a third go to a, a skilled nursing facility. If you're going to go home, you can go home the first day, but most of the time it's the second day that somebody's really you know, younger or really, really might need to get out of there. If you go to a skilled nursing facility, most insurances require you stay three, night, three nights in the hospital. If you go home, you have a visiting nurse and home health, uh, a visiting nurse and a therapist come to your house for a couple weeks, then you convert to, to outpatient physical therapy. If you go to a skilled nursing, nursing facility, you stay probably about two, two, three weeks. You can still have a nurse and therapist or a therapist come to your house when you leave the skilled nursing facility, but Usually by that point, you convert over to outpatient physical therapy. Most patients need about five to six weeks of therapy after hip or deer placement. That's the average. Some people don't go as long. Some people can go longer. You never have too much therapy, but you can have not enough. On average, from both with hip and knee, by four to six weeks, you should be moving around pretty good, not necessarily completely recovered, moving around pretty good. I have people who want to golf after you know, three weeks. Some people, some people take a little bit longer than that. Um, and then by 10 to 12 weeks, you should be mostly past it for the, you know, that's not everybody, but mostly past it. You still be stiff when you've been sitting for a while. That takes, that's just the human body it takes a while for that to go away. You know, your, 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 your endurance, if you're gonna walk five miles in the future, you're not gonna walking five miles every three months, which you should be doing most normal activities of daily living. If you do activities like tennis or pickleball where you're running and stopping and starting or softball, it may take a little bit longer. What I tell my patients to make themselves feel a little better about it is that it takes a 25-year-old more than three months to get over an arthroscopic ACL repair, okay? So if you're 75 had your hip replaced, give yourself a little bit of time, okay? All right. And that's just what I just said here. And I told you that, that most should last, if everybody's high-fiving, x-rays look good, 20 years or more. All right, knee replacements. More are done at about a little less than 600,000 in this country uh, every year. We talked about knee pain, so I'll go through the slides. Won't bore you, you saw some knee x-rays already. There's some more x-rays. Those are the, that's the various deformity we talked about there. Um, we have made our incisions smaller with knee replacement, but they have to be large enough to get the implant on. And I want to get to the slide coming up soon. MIS. All right, guys. Now, fellowship trained surgeon, I don't need to talk bad about other doctors, but I'm going to say something now. It means that you did extra training, okay? You will be hard pressed to find a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon, surgeon in the United States of America who does a lateral approach to the knee. The guy who's come up here and sold it like hotcakes is not a fellowship trained surgeon. Why don't we do it? We looked into it. 10, 12 years ago. I did, a, I did one of the little courses for it. We, we, we felt, oh, you know what? If you avoid cutting the quadriceps tendon, you have a faster recovery. True, true. 
Fast recovery, that's a good plus, right? Pro, pro, pros, cons? The cons, when you operate from the side, and I've told you about angles, making sure things are straight, alignment, you can't see what you're doing from the side. So it can work at first in some of the top surgeons' hands, Johns Hopkins, whatever. They did prospective studies where they did a side approach to the knee, a lot of approach, and they did the front part, the, approach to the, knee, the normal approach to the knee. They said over a third of the time, the implants were unacceptably crooked, and it's not good. So what it is is like, remember the, 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 the old thing, you know, pay me now, pay me later, the pure later commercial for the oil, and yeah. So somebody goes, oh, side approach to the knee, man, Herb was golfing in four weeks. You know what? Herb's in my office three years later getting advised because the guy who's doing it around here can't fix his own complications because he's not fellowship trained. What he did was he came out here with another company and he sold like hotcakes. And yes, patients seem to heal faster. But what they don't tell you is that the revision rate is like five times higher. That's why I say if, if only one person is doing something or another person trying to do it up here now, it's, got, it's people who I think are unethical or can't get business. Then either they're the best surgeon in the world or no one thinks it's a good idea. Now, how many people are doing it at, I'll name some places. Johns Hopkins, how many people? And eh. Mayo Clinic, and eh. Shands, and eh. Jewel Clinic, and eh. name, name a place, Mass General in, in Boston, and eh. Temple, and eh. no one's doing it because it's a bad idea. So please, I'm not saying this to bring patients to me, but if, if a friend is going to sign up, just tell them to go someplace else or get a second opinion. Because when we do have to go in, we can't use that side approach, can't get it off that way. Now you got two scars. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> All right. And I, okay, it's totally comp uh, replacement components. I'll hurry up. I know I'm long-winded here. Um, this is a hinge. It's not a ball and socket. So all knee replacements, no matter what company makes it, is essentially a femoral component, a cap, like, like a dentist caps your tooth or for, a, with a, for a cavity, a tibial tray, covers the femur, covers the tibia, and a polyethylene insert as a bearing surface. Plays the part of the cartilage. As you see, it truly is just a cap here. A little info. You say titanium and cobochrome. Titanium is a great metal as a fixation metal. So anytime you want metal fixed to bone, you can use titanium. But titanium is not very good as a bearing surface. So if it's actually receiving friction of articulation, it's very soft and will fret. So anytime that you have the metal where it's going to be moving and having some type of articulation, you need, you need to use cobalt chrome. And that's why here is where the femoral component slides on the liner, that's cobalt chrome. Here, this liner protects the tibial tray, that's titanium. All right. And these slides, I tried to get these slides and enlarge them because they were kept were small and they look a little bit uh, blurry, I apologize. But the conformist custom knee I've been using for some years now. I don't use it every time. The off-the-shelf implants, like I said, have worked well, and most patients are not getting custom knees. But I do believe that most companies will move to this in the future. And just like with the hip, we get a CT scan of the knee, and well, the hip, femur, and knee. I mean, hip, knee, and ankle. I'm sorry. And they make custom cutting blocks for which we prepare the bone. I found it to be muscle sparing. The shavings I take with the custom knee is far less than with the off-the-shelf implant. But most importantly, the knee even so much even more than the hip. You have variations of rotations and angles and things. And for the off-the-shelf implant, which I've done mostly for 15 of 18 years, and most people are doing it, we do a good job, but we're taking everybody and putting them to an anatomic norm which means no matter how you present, we're going to take and line up the, the, the devices for your tibia and try to cut perpendicular to the long axis. That's perpendicular, right? Is that perpendicular? That's the side, that's the side approach to the knee, see? Perpendicular to the long axis. Whatever your rotation is, we're gonna put your tibia tray facing at the medial third of the tibial tubercle. We're gonna take your femur and looking face on, we're gonna rotate it three degrees externally and for the long axis, we're going to take it. If that is perpendicular, we're going to have the femur facing about four to six degrees outside, called valgus. We put everybody that. That's what the 
the cadaveric studies tell us is the anatomic norm for a human being. But that's not everybody's norm, is it? I mean, everybody doesn't do that, but it works most of the time. Yes? Mm -hmm. or wherever the opposite is, um, those, uh, those conditions affect one's needs. Yes. So how do you take that into account? Very difficult. Because with the knee, we do need to put it in certain positions so that the forces that are, uh, that are directed across the implants from the femur to the liner and to the tibia are, such a, are distributed evenly enough that it'll last because if one side is being loaded more than another side. So what we say is this, it doesn't tend to be a big problem for people with foot and ankle problems, is that we need to put your knee where it needs to be. And if you have, if you have problems that are worsened or problems that pop up with your foot and ankle because of that, then we treat it secondarily. But we need to put the knee where it needs to go. In my 18 year career, I've had very few people who've had knee replacements, and then secondarily have had problems pop up with their feet. It just doesn't, you think it'd be a problem, it really doesn't, no, it's not a big problem. I, I used to see people like me who had some problems before knee replacement, but I, orthotics. Orthotics can be helpful. Now, the other thing is, what is the kneecap and what is the patella that you're You are correct because the diagrams I showed you so far do not have the patella in it. <laughs> <laughs> it is in there. Let me see if I have one with it. I may not have it in this thing. So what we do with the patella is this. That is your th third part. You have three compartments to your knee. Medial compartment between your femur and your tibia. Lateral compartment between your femur and your tibia. And the patellofemoral compartment. For the kneecap, 90 to 95 percent of us will take your kneecap during surgery, evert it, flip it over, so the undersurface is now exposed. Don't get too graphic. Take a saw, and saw about 20% or so, 25% of the undersurface of the kneecap to a nice flat level, measure to see what size oval button we're going to glue onto the undersurface of the kneecap. We try to cover as much as possible without too much overhang. And then that's how we resurface your patella. So then we will flip it back over so that after the surgery, you now have the polyethylene button that is touching the metal groove of the femoral component and not your kneecap. There are some doctors who don't resurface the patella. Historically, the part of the knee replacement that had the most post-operative complaints was the patella femoral uh, part. So some doctors said, well, if it didn't look that bad, don't resurface it. The only problem is that a lot of patients will come back with anterior knee pain. And it just so happens that today, we resurfaced somebody's patella who had knee replacement done some years back and they didn't do the, they didn't resurface the patella. So I had to go in there and just put a button on the bottom behind the patella. So are you saying the patella is in the back? No, no, I'm saying we put the button on the back side of the patella. Oh, okay. And so, and that there's no, there, there's no kneecap. There is no, no, they left it out of the picture. <laughs> they, they wanted to, sh they, they, they wanted to show you. <laughs> They were remiss, yes. <laughs> I might have one of the shows in kneecap, huh? If you drew it on exactly, where would it be? Let's see if we can, see if we can find one with it. I may have to find one. I'm not going to read these slides. I'm just going to talk to you about it. Um, no, you can't, you can't see it there. Can't see it there, but trust me, we, we for purposes of, because the kneecap is simple, so this here, and the, and the kneecap is the one part that is not custom. You just put the button back there, okay? So they're trying to show the, the custom parts there, but m most of us, we surface the patella, and we don't really have many complications. What, does, what can occur with patella resurfacing, or patella in general, is that you have to make sure that you balance it correctly. So make sure before you leave the operating room that when you flex and extend the knee, that it's tracking appropriately in the groove. If not, if it's mal-tracking, you can have an issue with that, so we have to make sure that it's tracking properly. You may need to do, to do what's called a lateral release, which means if it's not tracking just right, you may have to release some of the soft tissues on the outside part of the knee from the inside so that it can sit appropriately in the groove. So it's, it's our charge as surgeons to make sure that we check that before we leave the operating room. So 
I'm probably oversimplifying it. So if your problem though is find a patella, can you just have that button put in and not the rest of it? You know, so good question. Today was a, Megan, today was a per perfect day for surgery because today I also, I don't do this often, I also had, had to revise somebody who had an isolated patellofemoral replacement. So, the, so it's not that, that common, but from time to time you'll see somebody who has severe arthritis behind a kneecap and the rest of the knee doesn't look that bad, okay? So our patellofemoral replacements have not had a good history in this country. I did one in 2003 and regretted it. Okay, the woman had a pain, we'd, we'd convert to a total knee. Many of us, if not most of us, will do a total knee in that, situ in that situation. Because we've just, it's, it was just difficult to just put the button on. You can't just have the button, you have to have a little metal plate on, on, on top of the femur where it's, gonna, where it's gonna ride. It's just, it's hard to balance that. The knee, the native knee is not as forgiving with just doing that part of it. So we, they do make them and it would be a faster recovery, but just, you know, our outcomes for that, for that surgery are not but so good. They are all right, but many surgeons will err on the side that if it's, if it's that bad, it stinks to have to have the whole knee replacement, but we feel that the best way to, 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 to make sure that you have a good outcome that's going to last you a long time is just do the whole knee replacement, okay? Same thing with, with partial knees, partials. I do, a handful of those every year. They are popular, doing a, doing a, a unicompartment knee replacement, half knee replacement. Fast recovery. Unlike the lateral push to the knee, a partial knee is a viable option. The only thing with a partial knee replacement is that you just have to choose the patient correctly and really be sure and feel confident that, because all you're doing is one compartment. That's not the kneecap, that's just doing usually the inside half of the knee. That the, that the kneecap and the outside part of the knee is not that bad because the last thing you want to do is put somebody, it's still an operation, it's still a joint placement, is to do that and have somebody come back anytime within seven years and say, now this side of my knee hurts because now you need another operation. So many of us are very judicious with, with uh, offering that surgery to patients. The Orthopedic Academy says that 10% or less of the patients who present with arthritis of the knee to the extent where they need a joint replacement, 10% or less are candidates for partial knees. But what happens is, is that you have people who like doing partial knees, and if you have a hammer, everything appears to be a nail, so they'll take patients who shouldn't have partial knees and do partial knees. I can't tell you the number of partial knees I've revised, and I'll never forget, just one, and one time, I saw a lady that had, had a partial knee done by, by, by a doctor that I knew and in the area. And she had first gone to Ocala, and the doctor there told her she needed a total knee replacement. But he also told her that she had to go to rehab for, that he wanted to go to for three weeks, and she said she didn't want to do that. So he shouldn't have said that. Anyway, so she went to see this other doctor who said, you need a half knee replacement. And she had seen him recently, and he said everything was fine, but she was having a lot of pain. And she came to see me for her hip. Real smart lady, I mean, she might have been a school principal, I can tell. she was. And so she said, Dr. Williams, because we, we hit it off. She goes, can you take a look at my knee? It's in LMI. My knees bothered me. The doctor told me it was OK. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pretty expressive. I pulled x-ray up. I must have went <laughs> like that. <laughs> Whatever I did, and she said, I need a total knee, didn't I? That x-ray was ridiculous. I mean, her rest of her knee looked crappy. And the guy slapped in a partial knee replacement. So she needed to convert it. So just be careful. They, they are OK. I, I did one recently. But I just be very careful to make sure if somebody is 80 and their health is iffy, get that total knee. Because you, you do not want to come back for another operation. One time. Okay, guys. What's the downside of a total event of partial? Just, just recovery time. It's just, just I mean, I mean if, and partials still can take a little while, but partials on average will heal a little faster. And that's why the thing is I try to just caution patients. Everybody wants, listen, if I have to have surgery, I want to heal fast too. But I don't, I want the problem to be fixed. I don't want to, I don't want to be back a year later or whatever because I, because I got a little too anxious, okay? So with the, with the total knee, we have to open up the joint capsule more to put it in and do a little bit to the quad tendon if you're doing it like you're supposed to from the front. With a partial, we don't really get into the quad very much. 
We don't dislocate the knee like we do for total knee replacement. So the soft tissues have not been, have not been disrupted as much, so you can heal faster. Okay? That is, I mean, that, that, trust me, that, that is very enticing from, from both sides. We just want to make sure that you're not going to be back here again because of total knee replacement. Right, once, once again, looks good, you healed nicely, everybody's happy, 20 years or more. Okay? All right. So I got some cool little diagrams here, but let's just say this about the custom knee. I've done several hundred of them. It's, it's, it's amazing because they make custom cutting jigs. So what we do is this. So we open the knee up, and the first lot that goes on, if you have three big bone spurs on the outside of your knee and a big bone spur on the inside of your knee, that jig has all those contours in it and fits right on your knee <laughs> like a glove. It's amazing that, 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 that a 3D printing CT scan machine can make things that perfectly match your anatomy. And I don't change implants very often. And so it took, I did 15 years of Zimmer, that's all I did. So when I, the technology seemed interesting to me, so I decided I was going to do one. And from the first time I did it, it was pretty amazing, the custom meal placement. And we've had good results. The first person I ever did, like three, three years ago or so, was a pickleball player in the villages, big time pickleball player. He had won some tournaments. And three months after we did his knee, he won a tournament. Made, made me feel good. <laughs> All right, guys. So, so that's my, uh, my sweet custom knee. Yes, questions? No, 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 it's a good question. But for the most part, infections don't really, the implant, the device doesn't really affect the infection rate. The infection rate is, a, is affected by the biological host, the patient, and their system. It's affected by the environment. You would have a strong environment. That's why some hospitals may have a better track record than others. It's affected by the surgical technique. If, you know, for me, my tourniquet time is usually about 40, 45 minutes for total knee. I know some people that take two hours to do a total knee. So if the wounds open in a room for two hours, you have a higher infection rate. And some people, their sterile technique may not be as good as others, okay? Um, but the implant itself doesn't have an effect. Exactly what method is the right word? When it's rejected, is it the same material? Yeah, yeah, it, it, reject this thing. Most, a painful joint replacement 99.9% of the time is not rejection. It's something else causing the problem. It's not that your body's rejecting it. There are rare instances, and I mean rare, where somebody may have metal allergy to the extent that they're having a reaction to it. But, we will, but for most of the time, it'll be something else besides a metal allergy. Although they do exist, they're rare. I mean, I, mean, I have to make sure it's nothing else. I can't figure it out. There are some knee replacements can be a little temperamental, there are a subset of patients, everything looks fine, it moves fine, they just still, I mean, they're okay, they're happy to have it done, but they may be a little sore here, a little sore there, because it's a big hinge, okay? And I think that the custom knee will help reduce that, that those patients, because that's what I believe the outlier is when you're trying to take somebody who really has a lot of deformity. They were born with, we call tibial torsion, it's turned. And they have, and so we just can't recreate their own biomechanics by putting off-shelf implant in. And that's why it, it, you know, we got rid of their pain from the bone rubbing, but it just feels a little clunky to them. You know, you haven't had it done? Yeah, I'm, I feel better. It just, you know, I, it clicks a little bit over here, and a lot of knee places will click. But, you know, I feel a little loose here, and it hurts there. That's, I believe, because you just can't balance it as well as you like all the time. And the custom knee, we do far less soft tissue balancing the custom knee because where it tells us to put it is where the body wants it. Yes? Um, I've had two major back surgeries recently, I've recorded well as well, but I'm doing active sports when I play tennis three or four times a week. Ooh, uh, good. Golf three or four times a week, and also still soccer, so I'm 75. You're a man. Right, so <laughs> all the orthopedic surgeon said, if you're gonna have a replacement knee, you're gonna have to give up your soccer and my dog play singles tennis. He said he won't take the stress. I would say this. We say that because. By the way, my wife would agree with you, of course. Right, of course. Stop doing that, honey. Um, I would say this. We say that, like we say you shouldn't jog as a, as a form of activity because we as surgeons are supposed to t advise you to not do something that could compromise the lifespan of your implant. Okay? So obviously, if you're doing high impact, 
you know, aerobics and running and cutting on things. They say singles tennis, because you gotta run further. I play a lot of tennis too. You gotta run further than doubles tennis, okay? I don't know if you played only doubles as opposed to singles, whether well, it's gonna last 17.4 years or 21.8 years. So I tell patients, if you can do it, live your life. All of us, soccer is hard to me. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's the whole other thing. Is a, the knee isn't as strong as the original knee. Not all the time. It, it, you know, everybody's different. There, 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 there's some people that are amazing. They, they, they could do that, but it's probably just not a good idea overall to do that. I mean, sock, I, I hear you. I, I mean, your life, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but that's why he's saying that. He's supposed to advise you to do that. Just, I know I tell patients patient and stuff, you know. Well, it's still curve when you get in the knee, you don't say, oh, oh no, I would, do the, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would do the knee anyway, just it's up to you. I mean, if, if I saw somebody, don't downhill ski and jump off of moguls, they're like, <laughs> sure, doc. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm going to be candid with two new questions. Custom knee braces I wear right now. Mm -hmm. I think the lateral, both of them are. Lateral auto Okay. And uh, somebody who knew I was in that position. I'm not an AARP magazine or AARP fan, anything. But a couple, maybe a year ago, yeah, they ripped knee replacements. I mean, they gave me a, I don't know if you saw that. I mean, they just. You, you, know, you, you, you know why? Because hmm? the person, person who wrote the article, didn't have knee pain. If you have a knee looks like that first x-ray I showed you, and somebody does knee placement on you, and you went from doing this the whole life, well, and start doing this, you, it's worthwhile. I mean, I, 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 I tell patients, back to what I said, it's, it's a person's choice. You know, it's not life-threatening. Not life-threatening. If you want to live to be 100, you got a bad knee at 80, you'll make it. You may not be walking, but, but you'll make it. It's up to you. If I. 580,000 every year. If they didn't work most of the time, people wouldn't be getting them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and then. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, another thing is that, because, and not that, listen, we do a lot of non operative treatment too. I should talk about this, a lot of non operative treatment. But some of the stuff you see in the paper is like, it's coming from healthcare providers, or health professionals who don't do surgery. Right. So they right. want you yeah. to think that the knee placement is a bad idea. You know, we're going to do your gels and we're going to do this, that, and other, and put you on a laser thing and put you on this table and do all this stuff and you're going to be better. Now, if you have a really bad knee, at some point, the only thing that's going to work is surgery. And it works the vast majority of the time. And if somebody has a complication, I'll tell patients, there really is pretty much no complication that we can't fix. We don't get very many infections. We need to get an infection, we can fix it. It may take you longer to get over it, but we can fix it. There's almost nothing we can't fix. Yes? I have been needing knee replacement for a long time, but mm. I, keep, I, I keep trying to lose weight because it's supposed to be much better if you're not over a certain BMI. And, and, and sometimes I go to physical therapy. I would like to know, is there a way you or your office can name a, the body weight and test my muscles so that, you know, it would be like a good time to get the surgery? I mean, this, I, this you know, is, I could go tomorrow, but I don't feel like this is. The, 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 this is what we do. A couple of different things with that. Obviously, the stronger your muscles are, the, easy, the easier the recovery. But it's not that easy to do that if your knees are killing you. Okay, so we don't. I don't wait for somebody to go get fit to do knee replacement. Studies have shown that if you do preoperative physical therapy, it can help speed up the recovery time postoperatively. Reason why we don't make it a, a staple of our practices is because most insurance, company, insurance companies give you a certain amount of physical therapy visits per year. You can't eat them up before the operation. So you can do some things on your own. As far as weight is concerned, and as far as everything else, you know, and, and coming from Philadelphia where we got cheesesteaks and hoagies, trust me, I, I should have done a study on joint placement in, in, in the morbidly obese. I could have had like a, you know, a, a study of 400 or something. You are okay. 
I can say from here, okay? I, knees, I'm a little less worried about with the weight than hips, mostly because of the operation. The hips can be really hard for somebody who's really big. But knees, we can, we can get through. So, so when I see somebody for a knee replacement, they have to really, really, really be obese for me to not do the surgery. And I know that if I say, if somebody comes to me and says, doctor told me lose 100 pounds and come back, I said, he told you to get out of his office when he told you. Because you're not going to lose 100 pounds. I mean, not that you can't. But either you're going to do it. There are some patients that really it just, they are too big. And what I do with those patients is I, try, I don't just say come back when you lose 100 pounds. I try to give them some help. I, I'll see them every three or four months, weigh them do, 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 on your diet. You know, because I, I feel that if I, if they know that somebody is helping them and, and, and I see them three or four times a year, and one guy took them like four years and he finally lost weight to where I thought it was safe. But if I had kicked him to the curb and, and never talked to him again, he might have just gone with his tail between his legs and never done anything. I think coming back every, every couple months and putting him on a scale and say, you lose some weight, oh, you lost four pounds. He goes, eh. you know, but he's, he's, he's trying. So, so, you know, so, but I have a higher threshold uh, for doing people who are heavy than, than other people. And I've had good results with it. Like I said, I, we say, if you can work at Einstein, Philly, you can work anywhere. So, so, so if I were you, I, I wouldn't necessarily wait. It's always good to lose weight. It's always good to try and get fit. But if your knees are killing you, I wouldn't make you become super fit and lose a bunch of weight before I did it, okay? Anybody else? All right, guys. Yes, ma'am. So how, how do you take the, what is it, an x-ray or what? How do you figure out that custom fit? I mean, I went to, to visit the company in Boston and talked to a couple of engineers and saw the machinery and came out as confused. <laughs> All I know is that it, it's pretty high tech. 3D printing means you take a CT scan, which takes, the computer is able to like do thousands of images, recreate around to give you a three-dimensional model. Now, how they take that and put it into a machine and how that translates out to where the machine is moving and, and making the metal and things, that's hard for me to really describe to you, but it does. But you made the CT scan. Yes, but I, I no, I'm saying, I, I ordered the CT scan and the CT scan, and the CT scan, had, there's only a, a few places that have the software from the company. like. Lake Milk Imaging, it, it, we're in the Sharon Morris building, by the way, I should have said that. So a second floor of the Sharon Morris building, right by the hospital. And Lake Milk Imaging downstairs has the software in their CT scanner there. Medical Imaging Technology by my old office in Summit Plaza has it in their CT scanner. And Lake Medical Imaging in Leesburg, across from the hospital, has it in their, in their scanner. And that, I ordered the CT scan, and that's uploaded to the company. And then they take that CT scan and process it. And we, I used to look at the, at the they, 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 they would show us the, uh, what they've come up with and whether we agree with it, but after, after 10 of them, it was on point every single time that I don't really go through the process of having to, I just, we, we approve it. I don't, I, don't tweak, I, don't, I don't tweak it. It comes across me to say we, we approve it because we know it's been on point every single time. <laughs> There, there is computer navigated joint emplacement, and there's and there and there's there's um, like robotics, and those things can be helpful. What those are is this: it is they help on the preparation side, because the implant that goes on, I'll say the implants, they, they, the off-shelf implants that work fine, is an off-the-shelf implant. So at the end of the day, no matter how they prepare the bone, they're putting an off-shelf implant, which means that the same contours, the same biomechanics the implant and furs is going to be the same in everybody. But they try to, they use either MRI, CT scan, and through either the computer navigated, I'll say this real fast, computer navigated means you come in and we put these probes in your, in, in your, 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 your leg, hip, knee, whatever, and we figure it out and get all this information to the computer. And, it, it, and then, it, then it analyzes it, and it tells us where we need to make certain cuts. So that when you're doing the thing and you hold it, 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 it the light will turn green, like some, one device we, I saw, and it says, okay, cut here, you cut there, okay. You put it on, it's red, 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 you dial it in, it's in green. So it's the computer's telling you that's where you go. You cut there. No, no. Okay. This is all, all of this is done prior to coming to the operating room. 
they, they have done all that. We have custom, that is not a custom cutting jig. That is a cutting jig that the, the computer's telling me where to put it, mm -hmm. okay? And then the robotics like the Mako Plasti is they do the same similar thing, but you have a burr and, the burr, and, the, and you have all these probes in the knee, and then the burr will turn on or off if you're in the zone. So literally, if you, if, 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 if you pull it over the, over the tibia, and you're in a zone where he wants you to, to, to burn, it'll, it'll turn on And if you go outside the line, it shuts off. <laughs> so so kind of like, you know, a capuchin monkey, you can kind of do that one, you know. And then you repair the joint and put off-shelf implant. That's, those work fine. They work just as well as if somebody is lining up themselves. But they don't really push the needle or change, ch change the game very much because at the end of the, the surgery, the implant going on is an off-the-shelf implant that has the same rays of curvature and the same contours as every single one going everybody. One more, yeah. I've been having trouble with the inner knee, uh, uh, left knee, for about 20 years. Ooh. And, um, and then I stopped playing singles tennis 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I can still play doubles tennis. And okay. I can run maybe four or five or six steps. Mm -hmm. And and but I I'm not I can't run very much but I can stop and go. So um, is that typical or of a uh, deteriorating knee? Yeah, I mean yeah yes. All of us, every single one of us, as we walk in life, our joints are going to start to wear out. If you're really active like that, put more strain on them. They, they increases your risk of it wearing out more. It doesn't mean it's going to wear out. Some people can probably play tennis to 100 and not even knee pain. But yes, so you're having some knee pains, so it means you have some cartilage wear in your knee. Uh, and the, as we get older, it's just gonna get a little worse and you put a lot of stress on it. So with that, if it's not that bad, you get an x-ray, say it doesn't look bad enough for joint placement, you get a brace. He has an unloader brace, you put it inside of your knee, you get a medial unloader brace. Maybe do a little cortisone to calm it down, maybe do a little gel injection, take a little glucosamine chloride sulfate, put a little ice on it when you're finished that may be good enough to make it reasonable to keep playing. Until I'm 86? <laughs> Listen, if, you, if, you, if, if you're playing in your 80s, you're already a winner. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you've already got, you're good to go. All right. I'm Dr. Justin Trosclair, host of two-time podcast awards nominated A Doctor's Perspective podcast. I interview doctors in and out of my profession about their specialties and the occasional non-doctor special guests. But we also go behind the curtain and see what's working for their marketing, overcoming struggles, practical knowledge, book choices, and relationship advice. Join me on any podcast app on your phone or visit adoctorsperspective.net for the show notes pages and free resources. I want you to have an abundant home life as well as a thriving practice. So come on, take a listen. To learn more, visit x10therapy.com, 1-855-910-5633. Just a reminder, it's a huge help if you subscribe to, rate, and review our podcast. It helps people find us. X10, back to full strength.